the Word. Whatever a man calls his own is magically a part of him. His cut hair and nail pairings remain bound up with his being, objects with which he has shared contact are imbued with his personality, and his name is just as much a part of him as a limb is of his body. Objects with which he has no contact may likewise carry influence. Likeness has the most powerful ties with the man it represents. An individual's magic tension flows into his portrait or image. The reluctance of primitive people to be photographed is well known. They are afraid to leave fragments of themselves in strangers' hands. J.G. Fraser analyzes the principles of thought upon which these magical beliefs are based. They are of two kinds. First, that like produces like, or that an effect resembles its cause, and second, that things which have once been in contact with each other continue to act on each other at a distance after physical contact has been severed. Using the first of these principles, called by Fraser the law of similarity, the magician seeks to produce the desired effect by imitating this effect. Using the second, the law of contagion, the magician does to a thing which has belonged to a person whatever he wishes to do to the person himself. By mistreating a portrait, the magus will cause its subject, no matter how far away, to suffer. If the magician adds a lock of the victim's hair or his walking stick to the image, he will be combining the two principles, similarity and contagion, thus building up greater magical power. Calling the enchanted one by his name strengthens further the effects of the operation. The name is the only part of a person with which the magician can work when his victim is remote and no other belongings of his are available. This is why a name is a precarious possession, to be guarded jealously. Innumerable people have believed and still believe in the magical power of a name. This belief was especially powerful among the Egyptians. At birth, everyone was given two names, the true name and the good name, or the greater and the lesser. Only the lesser name was made public. The greater belonged to the Ka, and embodied all the individual's magical power. The evil spirits and the gods would vent their anger upon the lesser name, leaving the man himself unharmed. In the light of this belief, the priests of Egypt sought to discover the names of the gods, and thereby the ability to wield a supernatural power. At the sound of the true name, the powers of the gods stood ready to perform the invoker's bidding. This name being uttered on a river bank, the stream will dry up. And if pronounced in the fields, sparks will spring forth. If the magician who knows the secret name of a god is attacked by a crocodile, the virtue of this name will cause the earth to fall into the water. South will become north and the earth will be overturned. In the magic incantations of the Egyptians, not only the name but every spoken word has its supernatural effect. Nothing could come into being before its name had been uttered. Not before the mind had projected its idea upon the outside world could a thing have, have true existence. The word, the hieroglyphics tell us, creates all things, everything that we love and hate, the totality of being. Nothing is before it has been uttered in a clear voice. To accomplish its full effect, the word must be spoken correctly. Magic conjuration prescribed the intonation, the secret rhythm with which Thoth, god of magic and inventor of language, had taught to the wise men. Success depended on the exact delivery of the formula. Rhythms and melodies were studied in the Egyptian College of Magic or House of Light where the various other arts of magical conjuration also had their home. For in time, primitive beliefs became framed in an elaborate technique. More and more knowledge was needed for an effective conjuration. Thoroughgoing preparations had to be made before one was ready to begin. For nine days, the magician had to undergo cleansing rites. Then he anointed his body and washed his mouth with natron. Fresh clothing was obligatory, new and white. All the garments were thoroughly fumigated before the magician donned them. On his tongue, in green ink, the magician drew a feather, the sign of truth. And finally, in the color appropriate to the god of the hour, he traced a circle on the earth. 
Only then could he proceed with his incantation. To make an enemy harmless, the magician would smear his own feet with clay, placing between them the severed head of an ass and rubbing his mouth and hand with its blood. He turned to the sun, and heaving, put one arm forward, the other back. He addressed Seth Typhon, the evil one, in magical rhythmic speech. Thou terrible, invisible, all-powerful one, god of gods, a sailor and destroyer. In many ceremonies, the magus would utter strange, incomprehensible sounds, words foreign to the Egyptian tongue. With these names, either of Semitic origin or fancifully compounded, the gods were summoned. Since the word was charged with magical power, it had to remain unaltered. The words of the magical language were handed down through centuries, although there were few who still knew to what gods the bizarre expressions referred. An incantation from the time of Ramses II contains the following jumble of ancient verbiage. O Walpaga, O Kumara, O Kamolo, O Karkemu, O Asmaga, O Uana, the Uthun, enemies of the sun. This is to order those who are in your midst, the enemies. He died by violence who murdered his brother. To the crocodile he has vowed his soul. No man laments him. But he brings his soul before the tribunal of double justice, before Mamu Remu Kahabu, and those absolute rulers who are with him, who thus answers his enemy. O lion, black face, bloody eyes, venom, into his mouth who destroyed his own name, his father's, these have not let the ought lost their power to bite. This is doubtless addressed to the formidable judges of the underworld, lest they be deceived by the magical formulas offered by the murderer. It is a powerful counter-magic, designed to fathom the wiles of the criminal's soul in order to make certain that he receives his punishment. To the crocodile he has vowed his soul. Only one thing could resist the virtue of a word, still more powerful words, more powerful magic. Often the evil spirits would appear unbidden. Particularly fearful were the dead condemned to wander until their souls were annihilated. They were recognizable by their mummy noses, flattened by the swathings. Eluding watchful mothers, they would steal up to the cradles of sleeping children. One had to be wary when undressing. At night, the ghost spied upon the living waiting for the unguarded moment when a careless one might be dragged away. Against this danger was used the formula, the beauties of M, speaker of the formula, are the beauties of Osiris. His upper lip is that of Isis. His under lip is that of Nephthys. His teeth are little swords. His arms are those of the gods. His fingers are like divine serpents. His back is like that of Keb. Despite the elaborate ritual for the passage of the dead to the afterlife, it was ever to be feared that the departed would return to the home they had left. Complicated formulas had to be recited. <clears throat> o you, you son, lamb, you son who suckest milk from the mother you, do not let the deceased be bitten by any serpent, male or female, nor by any scorpion, nor by any reptile. Do not let the venom become master of his limbs, nor let any of the dead, whether male or female, enter into it. May it not be haunted by the shade of any spirit. May the mouth of the serpent, Mkaku F, have no power over him. He is the you. You who enter, do not enter into any of the deceased limbs. O oh, you who hear him, do not hear him with you. O oh, you coilers around, do not coil yourselves around him. I have uttered these words over the sacred herbs placed in all the corners of the house, whereafter I sprinkled the whole house with the sacred water at evening and at sunrise. He who hears this, the deceased, will remain stretched out in his place. All powerful words also help to resist earthly perils. On the edge of the pale desert one awaited nightfall uneasily. True, one's house was well guarded by dogs to ward off any nocturnal visitor, but it was more certain if, before turning them loose, one strengthened them with the magical words. Up, savage dog! I shall prescribe to see what thou art to do to this day. Thou wert tied up. 
Art thou not set loose? By Horus thou art commanded to do this. Let thy face be as open the sky. Let thy jaws be merciless. May thy strength immolate like that of the god Harshafi. Kill like the goddess Anatta. Let thy mane rise in iron rods. For this, be Horus and be Saft. I invest thee with the power of fascination. Take away hearing, for thou art the courageous, threatening watcher. In many conjurations, the magician identifies himself with a god or with several gods. A man attacked by crocodiles carries out. Be not against me. I am Ammon. I am Amhor, the guardian. I am the great lord of the blade. I am Seth, etc. The, po the potentates of the land believe themselves to be close relatives, sons of the gods. In battle, the pharaohs would turn to Amon-Ra, the sun god, to remind him of this bond. The king did not pray for victory, but demanded it as something that was his right. And the father of battles might respond, Ramses marry Amun, I am with you. It is I, thy father. My hand is with thee, and I am better for thee than hundreds of thousands. The highest powers of all, the supernatural rulers of the world, are obedient to mortal words. The world is order is perpetually in danger. A foolhardy priest might overturn the earth and the sky to satisfy his own or his client's wishes. How is it possible, we must explain with Porphyry the Neoplatonist, that gods should be subject to extortion like men? Quite different was the magic of the Mesopotamians. True, the Chaldeans were aware of the existence of the name of the highest god. Although it remained unknown to them, and therefore unutterable, it was invoked by them in times of great peril. This name was a distinct person, a divine hypostasis endowed with a personal existence, and hence having a power of its own over other gods, over nature and over the spirits. Not even the priests could learn it through initiation. No constraint could be exercised over it. As children recognize their parents to be their masters, yet seek to obtain from them the gratification of their innumerable wishes, so did the Egyptians behave towards their gods. The world revolved around their own problems and wishes, and the gods, like parents, had to succumb to their pressure. Like children, the Egyptians lied to their god elders without the feeling of remorse or without diminished confidence in the omnipotence of these supernatural beings and they knew that the gods could withhold neither their favor nor attention.